Next, we're going to talk about hydro pneumatic tanks a little bit. We've come up with our pressure booster. We've come up with the cheap end of demand. Now we've got to apply that a little bit, let's go a little bit more into the system, and let's see where we're going. Now, the first hydro pneumatic tanks did not have a bladder. Now, all you kids in the room and all you kids listening to me now, we say hydro pneumatic tank today, we're thinking about bladder tanks. We pre-charge the tank, it's there. So the question comes, on a variable speed and or a constant speed pressure booster, do you need a hydro pneumatic tank? And the answer is very simply, yes, you got to have it for drawdown. Water is non-compressible. So in order to keep from having short cycling, you need a hydro pneumatic tank on every pressure booster application so that when you cut the system off on pressure, you can handle a uh, flush of a water closet or taking a glass of water or something without having to turn the pressure booster back on. So the reason for the hydro pneumatic tank is to stop short cycle. The reason for the hydrodynamic tank is to prevent the booster pump from short cycle. Just that simple. This is what they look like. You got a charging tank on a charging valve, and we're going to talk about charging pressures a little bit further down the road, but they do need to be factory charged. I'm, I'm sorry, need to be charged in the field to the pressure required. And basically, here's a little example of what we're talking about. Booster system, a couple pumps, and typically uh, these would be on the discharge headers of the pressure booster could be at the high point, but we see most of them close to the discharge headers of the pressure booster. And we see probably a check valve between us and the pressure booster, hydromatic tank and typical piping. And what we're trying to accomplish is to be able to turn that pressure booster totally off for some period of time, especially at night and not running. And that way we can save a lot of energy and have the hydromatic tank maintain the pressure for us so we don't have a problem with, with, with water being non-compressible. So how do we do that? How do we size it? Let's take a quick look. Uh, this is critical, I believe, to the proper application of pressure boosters. That's why this has been discussed. Now, uh, the whole idea, again, is to provide drawdown between an on and off pressure to stop short cycling to save energy, to save energy. How do we size a hydrogen magnetic tank? A couple things that you're going to have to answer. First question is, question one, how long would you like the pumps to be off at no flow? In other words, you're saying, I've got a typical building here. The most efficient pump in the world is what? A pump off. The most efficient pump in the world is a pump off. can't beat it. So how long can I keep it off? Well, that's going to be uh, some factors based on the kind of building you're in, the kind of usage you're in, and how long do you want to try to tempt it off? You, you don't want a leaking faucet to make a pressure booster pop on and off. That's nuts. Also, the tank location becomes critical. Is it going to be on the discharge head of the pressure booster, which is the most common, or is it going to be located at the top of the system, which will give you the smallest tank? And real quick, to give you an uh, example, the most efficient place would be top of the system, which is probably the most expensive place to put it. And, and, and a lot of people like to just go ahead and put them on the discharge side of the pressure booster and be done with it. So let's walk through those two typical examples and show you the difference in size of a typical tank. So real fast and just make sure you kind of got the idea. Back to my pressure boost again. Let's assume in this case I have a pressure boost size of 124 GPM with a 58 pound boost. And I've got this particular setup and I'm going to put the hydro pneumatic tank, the bladder tank, on the discharge of the pressure booster or at the top. Which size, what size do I need? How do I size my hydro pneumatic tank? Now let's get something across to you, and you're going to be seeing more of this in a few minutes. The new ASHRAE energy codes basically ban PRDs. PRDs are gone. Constant speed's dead. We'll talk about more in a minute. So I'm going to eliminate the, the pressure reducing valve. I'm going to exit out so it's not even there. So I'm going to probably have a check valve there. And I'm going to have a tank sitting there at the discharge of the pressure booster in the equipment room at the same elevation as my pressure booster. Let's assume that's what we're doing. Well, in this case, my pressure booster is boosting up 58 pounds, but I got street, street pressure of 40 pounds. So when I go to look at the discharge pressure of my pressure booster under full demand, I'm at about a 98 pounds. Now, a lot of people in the world never have lived in the country where you have a hydro pneumatic tank or well pump. Those of you that listen to me already know this. You have to have a pressure differential to keep from cycling a pump to death. 
So if you live in a country with a well, you already know you've got a hydromatic tank on your well pump. You already know you're probably turning that pump on at about 30 pounds. You're pumping up to 40 to 45 pounds and cutting off. This big tank sitting there. So that pump doesn't go bam, 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 bam. You don't want that going on. So you guys that live in a country who have had experience would already know how these things work. This is no different than this pressure booster. We have to have some minimum deferential pressure to work with to make this work properly. And if you're taking a shower with 30 pounds versus 45 pounds on a properly sized hydromatic tank, you'll never know the difference. You guys that live in the country, don't, you don't even worry about it. Just such a gradual change is not a big deal. So in this case, a verbal speed pressure booster before it turns off is going to be to 98 pounds. When it runs 98 pounds and no flow, there's a way to come off. We basically do it on heat sensing because we're deadheaded, building up heat inside the, inside the pressure booster, and we cut it off. But we cut off at 98 pounds. At that point, we want this tank pressurized. When do we turn the pressure booster back on? When do we tell the system to turn the pressure booster back on? When the pressure drops to 88 pounds, in this case, or a 10-pound drop, we're saying turn the pressure booster back on. So the deferential pressures are at cutoff, we're going to have 98 pounds of pressure on the 100-gallon tank, um, excuse me, on, the, on that bladder tank. And we're going to cut it back on 88 pounds. We've got 10 pounds of deferential. Now, how much water do we need to put in that tank? So we've got the deferential established. We've got 10 pounds of deferential. We say it's fine. That's how we're going to use it. How much water do we need to put in the tank? Well, what kind of building do you have? And, and there's a chart that we can make available to you and because the message we're trying to get across is that one size bladder tank does not fit all. If you're in a, a hotel, the man is entirely different than a prison. If you're in an apartment building, the, 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 the demand is entirely different than a hospital or a school. So we're saying to you, how long do you want it off? How many minutes do you want it off at night? And this is based on a typical demand load profile of these types of buildings and the total GPM. And this chart is based on you being down 30, oh, excuse me, let's not use the word down, being off 30 minutes at night. Or 30 minutes of shutdown at night on the low draw. Based on the total GPM demand left-hand column, the type of building, will give you the gallons of water that you need to put into that bladder tank between 98 and 88 pounds called the acceptance volume. How much water do I put in that bladder tank between on and off so that typically I would be offline 30 minutes at night? Now, if I had an apartment building at 124 GPM, and I think you can see the column here, 50 GPM and 100 and 150, so if I kind of interpolate between those two, 124 GPM, an apartment building, I want to be off 30 minutes, then basically I'm winding up around 19 gallons of water I need to put into my bladder tank between on and off to be offline 30 minutes at night. Now, if I was in a hospital, you see it's a huge difference. And think about it. You know, hospitals at night don't really shut down. They keep going. So the message is with a hospital, uh, I need a much bigger bladder tank than wouldn't apply. So my message to you very simply is one size bladder tank does not fit all applications. You need to ask that question. So I need 19 gallons of acceptance volume for an apartment to be offline, what, 30 gallons. So let's take that and, and, and put it in this little chart to come up with how many gallons of water do I need to put into the bladder tank between on and off. Well, basically, 19 gallons gives me 30 minutes, right? So let's assume I want to be down 15 minutes. I want to shut it off 15 minutes at night. So it's half of that. So I need, I need nine and a half gallons acceptance volume. That's all I need to put in my tank between 88 and 98 pounds, 10 pound deferential, to come up with the size tank I need. So if I go to a typical tank size chart, hydropneumatic tank, 88 pounds, and I work on my acceptance volume, you come up with a .087. It's acceptance volume, and you need a 109-gallon tank. I've done a lot of detail on this, but you guys need to slow down and understand this a little bit. So basically, here's the same chart if I put the tank at the top, and all I'm trying to do is get across to you the acceptance volume. I said the 88 pounds was initial pressure, 98 was the max, so I've got a 10-pound deferential in my table. This is about as close as I can get, so my factor is .087. If I take a look at 
put in the tank at the top, then my acceptance volume is going to be uh, uh, same tank. I got to put 10 gallons in it, but my initial pressures are, are different. 43 and 33 up here at the top, and I wind up with a 50, 57 gallon tank required. So it, the message is by putting the tank at the top, it can be smaller. The pressures are different, and I still can take advantage of the hydrodynamic tank. I believe what you're going to find most commonly, it will be put at the bottom on the discharge header and not at the top. And that acceptance volume, those tank charts are very simple to follow, and you just kind of come up with that. Now, here's a tank at the high point again we just talked about at 57 gallons. Same 19 gallons of storage required, 15 minutes, 9.5 gallons is what we need to put in for just 15 minutes, being all 15 minutes. And you see the initial pressures are different. We start off at the, at the discharge header located at 98 pounds. But remember now, if I put the tank at top, what have I done? I've taken out the friction and I've taken out the elevation, right? And the pressures at the top would only be 43 pounds, where if I put the hydrodynamic tank at the top, it's going to see 43 pounds at cutoff. And again, if I go back down to the bottom, the hydrodynamic tank at the bottom, I needed 88 pounds to cut it back on. But when I cut the pump back on, how much pressure would be at the top? I take the 55 pounds of friction off, the elevation off, and at the top, I only need 33 pounds at the top. So my initial pressure, if I put the tank at the top, is 33. Final pressure is 43, still got the 10 pounds of differential between on and off. But look at my drawdown coefficient, it's now 0.168. To make a long story short, your tank size is about half, I'm down to 57 gallons, performing the same thing. Enough said on hydrodynamic tanks, just want to kind of get the message across to you. And one other little quick comment that the old plumbers have taught me that you ought to pass on to those people as you talk, what pre-charge pressure do you want? If you're at the discharge of the pressure booster, uh, the initial pressure is going to be 88. We're going to suggest you pre-charge the 78. If you're at the top, put your hydrodynamic tank at the top, we would suggest you pre-charge the 23. The reason for that is very simple. If you take your drawdown tank and take all the water out of the tank before you turn your pressure booster on, water is non-compressible. You're going to get a sudden drop in pressure. So the old plumbers are telling me they do this to make sure they don't get that sudden drop. In other words, if you pre-charge the 88 pounds uh, on, the, on the tank at the discharge of the pressure booster, then are you sure, are you positive, that your pressure booster is going to come back on before you fall below the 88 pounds? If you miss that just a little bit, want to be a non-compressible, you're going to have a sudden drop in pressure. So what the guys are telling me to do is pre-charge them to 78. That way, your pressure booster will come back on before you draw all the water out of the tank, and you won't get that sudden drop in pressure. Bottom line, if you're an engineer listening to me, you need to put that pre-charge pressure on your drawings because that tank has to be pre-charged before you hook it to the system to work properly. Hydrodynamic tanks, uh, new coats, ICC says that you've got to have ASME relief valves on. You got to make sure you do relieve the pressure. You got to put one on there. So when you go looking at a typical pressure booster system, you're going to have two hydrodynamic tanks. You're going to have one for thermal expansion for the water heater. And you're going to have one for the pressure booster, and the pressure booster has to have a pressure relief valve on the meat coat. But yes, there will be two tanks: one for the water heat expansion, and one to cut the pressure booster on and off. 